Currently at this moment, you are listening to a pastor, and you just listened to a pastor, who was ordained in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. For some of you, especially those sitting there, but maybe not there, this is common knowledge. But for others, I often hear people say, Olivia is a pastor. She talks on her Facebook page on Sundays. So sometimes I just listen for a bit. And you may not have any idea or really care about what it means when I say I'm ordained in the Christian church, Disciples of Christ. You don't realize that that means that our education includes three years of a master's program. For me, that also included two years for a doctorate. You may not realize that I had to go through multiple interviews to be ordained on top of that schooling, and that there are both groups at the local, state, and national levels that hold me accountable and continue to provide support. Mm -hmm. So you may not realize that I do not usually stand in this pulpit alone. I stand with the Christian Church Disciples of Christ as my primary connection to both other Christians and other denominations and interfaith conversations. And while the nuances between some denominations I don't think actually matter to the everyday person, and I would honestly say many leaders sometimes get way too caught up in some of those nuances. At the other, at the other way, I think the ways we use those nuances to expand or limit God's love can matter a lot. It made me think about the word non-denominational. It is a very popular word. People are very proud when they say, I go to a non-denominational church. Rarely do they realize that they are actually still part of a structure that parallels denominational structures. The language of non-denominational itself has been tricked. It has tricked many into thinking that they have chosen a more loving way because they think by saying that it means that they are not limiting God's love. And I love that about that moment when they say that. I love that many of them do not want to be limited, and I actually agree with them. But instead, I have found that words like non-denominational stop many of us from having more complex conversations about what it means to really live faithfully into the tradition and history and biblical and theological knowledge. We think that love should be easy, but as we know, love is much harder to live out than hate. An awareness that we are not all the same in our beliefs, but we are worthy and willing to be in conversation around those beliefs in quality ways. My love is actually the word ecumenical, but I love that word because it comes from being a part of the Christian church, Disciples of Christ. We are a denomination that has brought many denominations, many interfaith um, organizations together throughout our World Council of Churches and similar state organizations. We are a denomination that intentionally has leaders engage with multiple faith voices through the Christian unity and interfaith ministry. And we want to gather those voices of faith together so that we can stand more profoundly as the kingdom of God on earth. We can respond with more love that focuses on quality understandings of God that expand and do not limit God's love. The problem is that not everyone has a quality understanding of their faith. I would even be inclined to say that many have ultimately a selfish understanding of God, and that at times even includes me. We all want to be God's favorite. We have individualized our Christian faith to the point where we have often forgotten that we are not called as individuals, but as a kingdom and a communion. 
that our faith isn't a TV dinner of our choosing of what we like, but our faith should be more like a potluck. A potluck where there may be parts you like, parts you don't like, but everyone has been invited to bring something to the table to share. But that also means that you have to be willing to share. That also means that sometimes you have to try something new. And if you don't want to eat something, you just don't leave the entire potluck because there's something there you don't like. You recognize that all pieces of the food aren't directly for you, but of course you still stay. You're there for the company. But many people treat churches like they have to have everything that a person likes on the menu. And not only that, but everyone must like the same things. Thus, we might dismiss or ignore a person that may have shared a dish that they value because we can't see beyond our own taste buds. Now, I am sure I have shared this before. My favorite Disciples of Christ event is the NAPAD gathering. NAPAD is the North American Pacific Asian Disciples. And since I had some cute pictures of the NAPAD kids from General Assembly, because they're pretty awesome, I've gotten to know them over the years, I share that because during an evening of the NAPAD national event, they have their 19 plus communities and cultures bring food from their different traditions. This is not a potluck where someone just bought cookies on the way from the grocery. This is a potluck where everyone has brought something that has tradition and history and heart and depth. It is one of the most beautiful kingdom tables, and it is delicious. And while I am guilty of many a store-bought cookie for a potluck, that is not what we should be bringing to the table of God's love. We have to bring the deeper parts of ourselves to share. We have to realize that sometimes people may not want to try new dishes, but that God will invite all and never reject what we bring to the table if we bring it with deep, authentic selves. That while humans may reject each other all the time, God does not. And while we understand that we're going to go for what we know first, and that is okay, that means that we also need to go with the willingness to try new dishes. Even try things we may have tried before. So what happens, though, is that we live in a world with a lot of smaller tables. We're afraid to bring it to the big table. What if we are ignored? What if somebody doesn't like what we bring? Or if we bring something and they don't like it, do we blame ourselves? Do we blame each other? Are we able to acknowledge what is here at the table? But of course, to really accept and welcome everybody is hard. In today's short scripture, Jesus reminds us that the kingdom isn't something far away. It is here, among us. In fact, we say all the time in disciples, we have all we need in this room. We have all we need both in this room and in the virtual space, wherever we need. And I think that that can be understand on multiple levels. But we have to name what dishes are in the room and what other dishes need to be brought in as well. And so here is where my sermon could possibly once again get me in trouble. I could get in trouble actually with this one from a couple of different angles. Because I will say that many of our churches are tables that look very different from each other, which is a good thing, but also not a hard thing to actually connect and recognize each other's table. And I sometimes think our general level, which includes Canada, which is why it's not called the national level, but the general level, is also its own table that we as a small church don't really connect to it. Or that our regional tables are also their own table. And while we pretend as disciples and we try really hard to say we're inviting everyone in, I can promise that many of those pastors at the General Assembly table who were celebrating did not go back to the tables of their smaller congregations 
and shared the dishes that were brought. Because as the Christian church disciples of Christ, we don't have to share. I could easily not preach this sermon. You have no idea, most of you, what happened at our general assembly. We're not like the Methodist or Presbyterians who, to the average person, looks the same as us. They, however, have to answer to their higher leaders. We are just given really strong suggestions. But we're congregational. We can do our own thing. Each congregation can decide. But I do think that does a disservice to all of our congregations if we don't name what the different tables look like when our leaders, both at the regional and general level, gather. Now, to me as a leader, often these tables look amazing. It includes dishes that at this point I'm used to including. It is a kingdom that brings me joy when among those who are seeking to bring diversity and profound ways to love the outcast. But it is not often reflected in some of our churches. In fact, to many of our churches, probably if they were to go to a general or regional meeting, it would look like a foreign food. It would look like things that shouldn't be on the table. And so as I share with you what was on the table and some of the information from our General Assembly resolutions, I do it, and I promise I do it, not to change anyone's mind. I'm going to name that some of you aren't going to like it. Some of you may be ready to try it, but some of you may not. But I think it does a disservice to all of us if I don't name the dishes that are there. And I know that you will not outright reject it. At least that is my hope and my prayer. I thought about it as far as kimchi, which is one of those foods that I usually outright directly can't do. But I always want to try it again. Maybe this time. Maybe this time I'll figure out a way to like kimchi. Because my job is to expand God's love and to expand my palate and to remind me that all voices, even those that like kimchi, are invited to the table and that they should be invited to constantly be a part of the conversation at every level. Because the kingdom of God is not something far away, it is here. And that's scarier, right? It's easier to maybe put those places in different places, but if we say the kingdom of God is here and we look around and are forced to respond, what are we going to respond to? Are we going to respond with love and willingness and open conversations when the hard things are said? Because I do know that Jesus at least responded to the hard things, and that is what we are called to do. So our General Assembly agreed to a new structure that is now being implemented. Terry Horde Owens was re-elected as our general minister and president. And I will say those are the easy ones to share, even though those are not easy for the leaders in charge to actually implement. But your leaders, after years of study and many conversations, continue to believe that God is actively still wanting us to find kingdom among us, that God is still calling us as Jesus was called to respond to the injustices of the world around us. And as my colleague Bob Cornwall pointed out, we believe that God is still relevant. And as God's community are called to respond faithfully to all parts of life. So you can see I'm taking a sidetrack. Have you noticed? I haven't told you the tough stuff yet. (laughs) But I'm going to share this because I was a little bit nervous. I'm sharing this. As a kid, many people would say, you cannot talk about or say that in church. Church was supposed to be a place where you brought only your best self, not your real self. I, however, was a part of a church that let us bring our real selves. Maybe not all the time into the actual sanctuary, but all the time into the sacredness of church camp. And because I was able to bring my real self and life's real questions and life's real struggles, if it weren't for this, I would have probably joined many of my friends who find the church irrelevant, even when they don't find God irrelevant. But the Christian church disciples of Christ 
wants to be relevant, wants to be God's love actively moving in this world. They want us to face the hard realities and respond with God's love. And thus we must admit once again we may not like the dishes that are brought to the table, while others may celebrate what has been brought. And then I thought once again, maybe I shouldn't share. But the church I was raised in, the church I'm ordained in, the church that I have been educated in, said we could talk about hard things because those are the things that are important. So, the two social justice resolutions that are the biggest hot topics approved by the General Assembly were that we as a denomination will stand up against Christian nationalism and anti-transgendered laws. Now, some of you, that is good. Some of you, that's probably not. And in fact, some might want to leave the table right now knowing that these are there. And maybe I could have done what many of pastors do and just hide in the corner, not mention that those were passed as resolutions at our General Assembly but that just isn't what I know this church to be, both in this way and in the bigger picture ways. This church can talk about the hard things, that no matter what your reaction to these resolutions, you will be diligent in learning the ingredients, the preparation, the people involved, and the other details. You will learn about the chaplains who stood up and spoke that serve our country. You will take time to learn about those who came to be recognized, even though they have made different life choices. And we will have faithful responses rooted in love, not hate, not fear, but love, to learn more. Because by willing to engage, we are willing to not just think of God as something far away and unconnected and disengaged. We will be able to celebrate that God is relevant and present in today's world and realities. And that we are part of a church that is constant conversation to bring God's love and justice to the world in relevant conversations and understandings. We are a church that believes God's kingdom continues to be truly among us. God's love is not something stagnant or stuck. It is growing, expanding, and more accepting like Jesus continued to teach us to be. And so I leave you with these words as we take all of this in and take time to reflect and do our diligent, faithful work. It is the words from Psalm 34. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy or blessed are those who take refuge in God. So let us taste, let us see the goodness of God as the kingdom of God. Amen.